Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. We both sound podcastery. We're good. Great. We want that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. Three, two. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we're back. And we're both having not a great week. This has kind of been like a, uh, it, it's just been ebb and flow, man. Stuff's been really good. And then you just get nailed with something. It's kind of like just waves crashing on the beach where you think like, oh, I got my, I have my bearings and I'm good to go. And then something else hits you and you're like, fucking ass like god damn it i thought i had my shit together and apparently i don't yes and it's weird that it's happening to us at the same time which is why we must be psychically connected there's some there's some real bad stuff going down which i talked to you about earlier yeah uh sorry folks i'm not going to talk about it here yet and then there's some real good stuff happening which tommy i'm sorry to break this news to you considering your bad news but <laughs> <laughs> i did get my promotion it has gone through I was actually saying this. I'd rather be excited for you about work than kind of like think about like, all right, I'm pissed at what's going on with work right now. Like, yeah, or, or, I'm, Tommy, I'm, yeah. for some context, folks, Tommy is having a little trouble with his work. I don't want to go into too much detail, but, you know, I'm not having trouble with my work. So I felt <laughs> weird sharing the news. <laughs> <laughs> but, and i i want to put it in like just to give it context though it's like it's not like trouble with work it really is something like i felt like it was going in one direction and it kind of pivoted real fast and i was like i didn't expect that and they were like oh, okay well that's what it is and it's like it's not like i'm losing my job or anything but i really got like my Kind of like I, I was set off in one direction. I was like, all right, this is where it's going. And now it's like, yeah, that's not happening anymore. Expectation versus reality. It would be like, you know, if my job came to me and said, you're going to get this promotion. It's on, you know, the board of directors desk. It has to get approved. And then if they came back to me and said, oh, that's actually not going to happen now. I'd be like, oh, that's not good. But that didn't happen. I have the job and it's going to go into effect in April. And here's the deal. I got the offer and it it wasn't what I had in my mind. And my mind instantly goes to, oh, I'm being taken advantage of. I should be getting this. So I'm like, whoa, hold on. Take a second here and think about this. Number one, it's a decent raise. It is. Yeah. Number two, we are in a COVID recession. So the fact that I'm even getting a promotion is a miracle, honestly. Three. I don't know how to do the job that they're promoting me to. I don't know how to do it. These guys have to show me how to do it. So I, it would be stupid of me to play hardball and then send them back with like another <laughs> offer. And I'm so happy that I took the five seconds to think about this and just sign the paper because this is, this is the first step. You know, this is the first step. And I'm glad that they got it done for me. I'm happy to be working with this team. I'm happy to be moving into this new role. I'm ready. It's all good. Can you explain what it is? Or is it like, you don't want to talk about it? Here, Here's the comparison I'll give you. Think about architect and foreman. Architect designs the plans, gives them to the foreman, and the foreman builds it, right? Yeah. Right now, I'm a foreman. I'm becoming the architect. Dig it. All right. Really good analogy, too. I like it. Yeah. I've been trying to think of an easy way to explain my job, and that's the best one I can come up with. 
Yeah. So no more, no more implementing more big picture. Yes. I like it. I like it. That's really cool, dude. I'm so, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Like I was so proud, like as much as I was, I'm proud of you for this and I'm so excited for you. I was just, I, I, I'm not as excited as I was as when you passed your test. (laughs) Like, that oh man, for me was that was it, it, like I actually I I almost ran up the steps to tell Kelly. Instead, what I did is <laughs> I just, I just grabbed my phone and texted her. And I'm like, Keith passes test. <laughs> I'm still I still don't believe that. You know what I do? I log into the the PMI website to look at the certificate, and then I start looking at my test results, and then I see that I scored like under where you're supposed to score for most of the sections. So I must have just passed. And then I'm like, wait, maybe I didn't pass. And then I get so neurotic. I'm like, dude, you, you passed. It's over. Get the fuck out of this website. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for, after I passed my math test, I actually kept logging in to just see my score. Cause it didn't, yes. like, it didn't feel real. Yes. Um, and what I finally did was I, I just took a screenshot of it. And I yeah. kept it. On, I I still have it on my phone to this day in my saved photos. Yeah, that that high is worn off. I I'm not logging into the website anymore, and I can't start getting credits to maintain the certification until the last year, which is two years from now. So I'm just going to relax. Besides, with this new role, they're tasking me to learn a bunch of learn about a bunch of new technology, which is right up my alley. So. I'm shifting gears into that. And I forgot to mention right at the beginning of the show, folks, tonight, Nathan Gray from Boy Sets Fire. Classic, classic band. Uh, They set the template for, you know, bands like Thursday and a lot of those emotional hardcore bands. Really excited to talk to Nathan, and he's going to be joining us shortly. Also, they're they're good friends with uh, All Else Failed. They took them to Europe, for goodness sake, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to ask about. Do you remember those crowds? Like, what the fuck? I, I remember seeing a couple pictures from like Pat, and I was just like, "Holy fuck!" Like, I, I that kind of floored me. Was like, that's that's not what I expected that to be. Like, and I, I really didn't have an expectation, but when I saw it, I was just like, "That is a sea of people." To give it some type of like uh, perspective, like think large theaters. Like large theaters packed. Think corn at uh, Woodstock, nineteen ninety nine. But uh, no, I just wanted to jam that in again. Uh, it, it was a lot of people, and yeah. you know, I've been thinking a lot about what Tara Mayer from End of the Ocean said in the last episode. That I, that was the part of the conversation that gripped me the most when she talked about the differences between touring in America versus touring in Europe, and. God, it just seems like such a better deal in Europe. Look at those crowds that Boy Sets Fire and All Else Failed had. Tara said that you get a meal over there. There's government there's government stipends to support venues and artists. Like, ugh, it, it depressed me. And it also made me happy knowing that those kinds of things exist. Yeah, I think that's one of those things that I am conflicted with this because in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm so lost. That's so awesome. That exists. But the other hand, the government stinks at handling money. I don't yeah. know if they I don't know if I want them handling money for artists because in my head, I'm going like the second you waste a, a, even a penny. I'm like, dude, that could have gone to X, Y and Z. So I, I'm kind of back and forth with it i'm kind of glad the government doesn't have their hands in that because also then they can kind of dictate what you get to do with your venue or they get to impose certain things that you might be like no fuck you we're having a bunch of noise bands play tonight (laughs) you know what i mean like yeah it'll be like uh bank of america venue presents cia uh the band yeah yeah some shit like that where you're just like uh you gotta have like a bunch of stuff in there that's just not fun and it's and there's like military recruiters there picking people out of the audience and (laughs) hey hey you look like you you look like you can hold an m16 (laughs) you ever want to travel the world (laughs) like oh oh, you know what my my philosophy used to be tax the shit out of the rich or at least tax the rich and then that money will be used to fund things that we need in this country but that wouldn't happen. Our government is atrocious with handling money. So I see why all these rich guys want to funnel the money offshore and hide it because our government's pretty hopeless. 
I saw this one time where people were like, uh, I forget who this was, but it was a, an economist talking about proposing a really heavy tax on like, you know, the 1%. And he was like, yeah, we've tried this before. We did it in the 1930s. And what people don't really understand is that people aren't like wooden pieces on a chessboard. It's not like I move this here and I move that there. And then therefore the market reacts like this. There's literally millions upon millions of variables in play. And when you tax the rich specifically, because they are rich, they can afford the people that know the tax shelters, they know the tax law in and out, and they're able to move the money in ways that they don't get taxed for it. I remember seeing one time where people were talking about like what how the you know the rich get away with not paying taxes on certain things. And what uh one of the guys said was one of the loopholes was people would buy works of art and really expensive ones. So say you you know three, four million dollars on a painting. Right. You would, you would then donate that painting to a museum or actually essentially lease it to the museum for them for a period of time, which then the government sees as a tax write off because you no longer are in possession of it. But eventually at the end of it, you get that $4 million piece back, which may or may not have, you know, increased in value. And on top of that, um, you don't have to pay taxes on any of that money because it's seen as a charitable donation. And it's like, fuck, dude, there's so many people out there that know this stuff so well and they know how to, it's like, you know, imagine playing chess against Vadim. Like he knows, the, <laughs> he knows the game inside and out. Like he, he already knows plans of attack. He knows how to counter moves. Um, he knows openings he knows how to control the center of the board he knows how to finish the game very quickly like it, you would have no chance and i think that's what i see a lot of times where they're like tax the rich and it's like yeah but then the rich finds a way out of it like that's why they're yeah. rich <laughs> there's <laughs> always a way around it and i meant to ask vadim if he watched queen's gambit and if he liked it Vadim, I know you listen to the podcast, so hit the group text and let us know if you liked it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I still have not seen that. I actually have spent a lot of time. Uh, what have I been watching? Oh, uh, there was a documentary about PA Hardcore. Uh, oh, really? On Amazon Prime. I watched that. It was very, very good. There was a handful of stuff in there, though. I, I it, They mentioned bands, and I was like, Oh, I've heard of that band before, but they did a whole thing about like CCs and music, um, the eerie scene, like with Brothers Keeper and stuff like that. And it was, it was very cool. I feel if there's ever another PA hardcore documentary made that you and I should be a part of it. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know. That's, I think, I think you should be a part of it. And here's Why? my, here's my thinking with it. I loved being a part of hardcore but in terms of my memory and in terms of like what I know about the history of it, I pale in comparison to some other people like Vadim knows so much more uh, and you know so much more. There's so many bands that like I, I just I didn't listen to or shows I didn't go to. And keep in mind when this, the scene was kind of like real big when we were younger, like 97, 98, 99, 2000, I was there. 2000 i moved to wilkesboro to go to college yeah and you weren't around anymore no i i, I mean i i skateboarded up there i played lacrosse uh and then i didn't when, see you again until you came home from college i didn't come home really i i mean no we remember you hit me up on myspace and i i was i still remember that message you were like hey i i know we talked back in the day like we should meet up and i was like wow like yeah. I'm surprised he reached out. Not because like anything was wrong, but people don't do that very often. And I was like, all right. I think my thing was, is like, I had been away for so long. I felt disconnected from it. And the only real connection I maintained was when a life once lost would come to Wilkes-Barre to play cafe Metro or yeah. play home base. And I would go see them. Um, that was the extent of my time with the scene then. And I think it was nice for me to kind of, I walked away for a little bit and when I came back, I appreciated it so much more. And even then, I think a lot of it was, I liked when I was in college that I kind of took time away to explore other things. When I started really getting into like lacrosse, it was like, it was something that was, it wasn't new to me, but it was something I had never taken really seriously. 
And in college, it was nice because it was like, no, this is you lift weights here. You eat together with your team. You go to study sessions with your team. You go watch game film with your like it was it was kind of like um, it was like. Jordan. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> so now it's time to talk to Nathan Gray from Boy Sets Fire. Here he is, folks. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Nathan Gray. Nathan, welcome to the show, and how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So how are you doing uh, in these crazy, crazy times we're living in? What's your life look like in the never-ending COVID lockdown? <laughs> it's it's very different. I had, um, I had a lot of tours set up in 2020 that got moved to 2021, which could feasibly move get moved to 2022 now. So uh, in order to sort of keep my head above water, I've done a lot of online shows, things like that, and uh, tried to sell like certain special shirts and stuff like that to go with the shows uh, because that, you know, that was my livelihood. So uh, being stuck at home is is real bad for <laughs> for a touring musician. <laughs> Absolutely. So the tours, is this a solo thing or was it Boy Sets Fire stuff or both? It was it was mostly solo. There was one Boy Sets Fire tour set up. It was uh, uh us and Hot Water Music were going to do a tour in the in Europe. Oh wow. And um but I think that got pushed to 2022 already. And then all of the shows that I'm doing solo, which I had set up in the States and in Europe, have at least been pushed to later this year. Folks are saying fall now, like Madison Square Garden has scheduled some shows for fall. So yeah. I, at this point, I don't believe anything. I'm like, I, when, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, when, when I see video from the show and people in the venue, I'll believe it. Right. They say, keep hope alive. And I call complete bullshit on that. I feel <laughs> like, I feel like it's better to just not expect anything. And then if it happens, be pleasantly surprised. Exactly. Yeah. So where do you live now? In Elkton, Maryland. Oh, okay. Yep. And so let's take it back a little bit. I want to understand some of your background. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Newark, Delaware, for the most part. So I was born in what <laughs> the East Coast is. Where, where are you guys at? Uh, we both grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. So you know the East Coast fairly well. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, you know, as you know, everything sort of smashed up together around here. So, uh, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Elk, and sorry, and Maryland, certain areas of those like Landenburg, Pennsylvania, Newark, Delaware, and Elkton, Maryland might as well be the same area. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was born in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, lived until I was about 11 in Newark, Delaware. And we then moved down to Florida, Pensacola, Florida, because my dad is a pastor and he had gotten a job as a pastor. No, I'm sorry. He was going to school in Florida and, and working in a church down there. So we moved down to Pensacola, Florida uh, until I was about 19. Wow. So was it like strict religious uh, type household growing up? It, to an extent, to an extent. It was, I, I had a, a very strangely different upbringing than many might have in that situation where where I feel like the the churches we went to weren't awesome but I always I never really had a problem within my own family you know I always my my parents were always wonderful my grandparents were always wonderful despite uh, probably having a very different opinion than I do on such things um and you know, I, I just, I didn't really have that oppressive religious upbringing as far as the household was concerned. Now, outside of the house was a very different story. And the churches we went through, I went through a lot of, well, I mean, abuse within those organizations. Ah, uh, yeah. So what, were you part, were you a member of the church or working as the ch working with the church and experienced some abuse at the hands of the clergy or something like that. Yeah. Well, my dad was a, 
I want to say a deacon. It's hard to remember back then, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but he was he was a member of this church in Pensacola, Florida, and um, and I, I we we lived breathed the church. You know what I mean? Yeah. We were always there. It was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights, uh, and everything in between. We lived in a trailer park that was part of the church property. And, um, and so I was just always there. So, and, and this church in particular, there was like a, a Bible college on the campus. Like everything was on that campus. There was a school I went to that was involved with that church. Like it was, it was, in, it, it's, it was like a compound, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Very so, inclusive. Like yes, every, yes, yeah. very, right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, um, and that's where, a lot. Of, I mean, after that, we went to churches and stuff where I didn't have as much issues. But this one in particular was was a fairly horrible experience in my formative years. <laughs> so, what happened? Did you talk to your parents? Was there like a cover up, like we hear about all too mm-hmm. often? What was the situation? No, I. I it was more that uh, no one ever knew about it until. Well, I'll get to until in a minute, but to speak to what actually went down. In a lot of cases of especially sexual abuse in the church, and when you're living on a church campus, everything you're doing is in that church, uh, there is a real fear to say anything. Right. And it doesn't even have to be implicitly said, you know, uh, no one has to say, if you do this, you'll be in trouble. It's, it's more that in your mind, you're thinking, this is all I know in my life. I, if I say something, what's going to happen? No one's going to believe me. Uh, number one. And number two, even if they did, what's going to happen? Like, I'm going to cause all this chaos in my world, you know? Like you said, though, it is, it is in so it is, it's all, it's your entire world is that life. So you see it as like, if I make one ripple, there's going to be a huge effect through school and my, through my father, my family, my friends, all the people that are around you are now going to be affected by this when you can kind of just feel like I'll just bottle this up and keep it to myself. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Like you end up taking on this sort of like (laughs) martyrdom almost where it's just like, well, I just have to take this. That's just how it has to happen. Uh, Because otherwise, it's just going to cause too much trouble for everyone else. And you lose yourself in that. Right. And being being so young and experiencing something like that, Mm -hmm. you don't know what options you have. You don't, I mean, at least I'm I'm speaking for myself, at least I didn't know Mm -hmm. about child protective services or being able to go out to talk to somebody or, Mm -hmm. you know, I've experienced certain things where I did say something and then I just got my ass kicked even more. So it's like, you know, you, you just don't know what to do. And it it just has to be extra hurtful Mm -hmm. from a church. A church is supposed to be a safe haven. Yes. You know, it's supposed to be a community. So Mm -hmm. to experience betrayal from that community, it's got to be like just terrible. Yeah. It, it was awful to the point that, I pushed it down and buried it and never really talked about it until I was hell. Like I started doing my solo stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, it was, and, and went through so much in between, uh, just with all the things that come along with burying something like that and the, the lashing out and the drinking and the drugs and the, you know, just everything that you do to try to sedate something from coming out, you know? And, 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 and all the confusion that comes with it and all the things that, you know, uh, anyone goes through when they deal with such a situation. Uh, but it wasn't until my first solo album, Feral Hymns, where I actually wrote a song about it, Echoes, and actually spoke to it. Uh, so it was only a few years ago, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm well into my 40s <laughs> right yeah. now, so... Well, yeah, it's it's so difficult. I really hear what you're saying because I've been through some of that myself. Different traumas that I tried to bury with uh drugs and alcohol and mm-hmm. you know whatever else I did for decades to to try to cover that stuff up and only now approaching my 40s, very close, mm-hmm. um have I even begun to start to work on some of that stuff. 
and it's painful you yes. know it, mm-hmm. it, it's it's very painful it's it's painful difficult work yes it is but good, good for you for doing it though you know i'm getting there yeah i'm getting there <laughs> it is incredibly difficult and don't ever let anybody tell you different you know I actually thought about this the other day. I saw somebody had posted something on Instagram and they were like, this is one of the first times in my life where rather than turning to drugs or alcohol or nicotine or food or something else, I'm just going to force myself to sit with it. And I was like, wow, that's profound in that so often we try to run away from things or cover it with something else. And what we end up doing is compounding the problem so when we do deal with it it's exponentially worse yes and it's like if you had just sat with it in that moment there's times Mm -hmm. where i've done stuff where i've looked at it and been like and keith and i have talked about this pretty publicly on on the show is that we've both struggled struggled with addiction uh Mm -hmm. mine specifically was alcohol but like i i think my thing was i used it as an escape from just the month like i would get bored with life yeah, And th- there was times where I sat down and just would go, well, I have nothing else to do. I might as well drink. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. it's so yeah. s- like now I'm like, I think of all the things I could have been doing during that time. And it, if I had just sat with it, if I had just spent time with what was bothering me at the moment, mm-hmm. it would have made so much more of a difference. Yeah. Without a doubt. But, but at the, at the same time, uh, I guess you can look back at that as a lesson, but in the same way, you can't beat yourself up about it. You know what I mean? There's, you're, you're not ready until you're ready. And I think that that's something that gets missed as well. A lot of times I know dealing with my, uh, one of my sons who dealt with addiction with heroin addiction, uh, he wasn't ready until he was ready. And it was so frustrating. And it yes. was in that way where you're just like almost shaking him and like, y- y- and you're doing everything wrong to help him because you're too frustrated and angry. And why won't you just change? And I'm sure he's asking himself that now. Why didn't I change earlier? It's just like we all do. We all sit and go, ah, if I just would have thought the way I think now, I would have changed then. But that wasn't a possibility. And and we have to remember that about human beings is that we are never ready until we're ready. It's just the facts. That's the difficult part is you can't give somebody that willingness. And boy, I wish I could sometimes. So, mm-hmm. you know, I work, I work on myself to keep myself clean and sober. I work with other people. So my, I know, I know that people aren't ready until they're ready. So my method is like, I'll give people my number and I'll be like, yo, uh, if you want some help, call me when you're ready, you know, right, right. that's how I'm not going to convince. No one was, no one was going to convince me before I was ready. Oh yeah. And I'm not, I'm not going to convince them. Yeah, no, absolutely yeah. not. And unfortunately that ends in some very tragic events sometimes where people don't get to the point where they're ready. Um, but it's, <laughs> I, it's it it sucks to say that um, it is what it is, but it really is at times where you can't force someone to get help. Yeah, I've been in that situation. A close friend of mine, I talked to him on a Wednesday. I'm like, let's let's go to this thing. I mm-hmm. think it'll help. And he's like, uh, I'm not feeling good today. I'll hit you up Friday. Mm-hmm. And then the next day he's dead. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, that's an all too common a scenario. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So you moved back to the Northeast when you were 19, did you say? Yeah, I was 19 and we moved, funny enough to say north the Northeast, because we literally moved to a place called Northeast Maryland. <laughs> ah, nice tie-in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we moved, uh, my, my dad had gotten a job pastoring at a church in Northeast Maryland. And so we moved back. And um, I spent, I guess it was my senior year. Yeah, senior year, because I I failed fourth grade. So I was a little behind on everything. So um, it was, yeah, I graduated in 91, I want to say. Goodness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's difficult to keep track of times. But uh but yeah, Northeast Maryland is where we were up until I decided that I wanted to move move back down to Pensacola, Florida, because I had made friends there, all of that. Um so 
19, we, we were in Northeast Maryland. I moved out of the house after I graduated high school, went back down to Florida for nearly a year. And that ended in just being homeless and awful. Like <laughs> it, it wasn't a great time uh, right. to the point where I remember we had, I, I was just relaying this, fr- this story to a friend where we had gone to New Orleans because you could drink younger than 21 in new Orleans and it was only three hours away. So a friend who had a car drove us to new Orleans and I stayed there uh, (laughs) for several days. And I do not remember how I got back. Um, Wow. I, I, I remember I met up with some, I met some people, some punk kids and we just went crazy for several days and the next that like I go off the map in my head, off the grid in my head. And then all of a sudden it comes back and I am at a friend's house in Pensacola, Florida, calling my dad for a bus ticket. Jesus. Holy shit. Yeah. And I, I have no idea what happened. Now that sounds like you had a good time. Yeah. I, I, I have to assume I did. No clue. <laughs> you know, I always wanted to visit New Orleans. Mm-hmm. I, I don't drink anymore and I don't do drugs anymore. And I haven't for, it's for multiple It's pointless to go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I don't want, I don't want to go now. Let's just yeah, say yeah. that. Yeah. There is a lot of good music, but I mean, you got to go bar hopping to hear the music, you know? So forget it. Yeah, forget it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, how, so you end up back in Maryland. How, mm-hmm. how do we, uh, how does Boy Sets Fire come together? Like, how did you kind of, uh, get involved with the scene back up in Maryland? Right. So funny enough, uh, I get back to Northeast Maryland and I recover for a little bit. And, um, I started going into Newark, Delaware because that's where all the punks hung out. And yeah. so, and that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to hang out with the punks. So I, there was this, uh, Roy Rogers on main street in Newark, Delaware. And, uh, I think I was actually dating this girl at the time and she knew people in the scene. And so I just started hanging out, you know, and meeting mm-hmm. new people and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't long after that, that I started looking into starting bands and um i did a few bands uh it, funny enough so i had gone to high school before i moved back to florida and then back again with uh chad from boy sets fire uh and that's where we met was was in high school and then um then i josh and i have known each other since uh, since we were born um so our our parents were friends before we were even born. So funny enough, those were the people I started looking to for bands, you know what I mean? Playing in bands. And, uh, Chad and I started a band called Jones Chapel. I had started another band with Josh, um, called Attic. And then I had started another band called nine with some other friends. And they all sort of, they weren't really at the same time, but they were on and off around each other. And I think Jones Chapel was probably the last band I was in with Chad. But once again, it all gets so confused uh, through the years. Um, It was so I I wrote two books and it was so hard getting this information together in my head. (laughs) Uh, I had to ask my parents and friends, like, what the hell was going on at this time? But um, so... The, what what had happened though was that I could never get Josh and Chad together in a band, and I kept trying to get the three of us together in a band. All of a sudden, so we all sort of lose touch a little bit. Um, and Josh and Chad marry sisters, so they start hanging out more. Then, so that's when I am then in that band nine, mm-hmm. uh, which. In Newark, Delaware at the time, being in a political band was sort of unheard of. Like it was very like the scene was very apolitical. It was just very like uh, you were either talking about feelings or getting drunk. That was about it. Um, And um, and no one toured, really. No one really got out of Newark. It was just a very there was a strong local scene, but nobody really went anywhere. 
So, and I am currently in a band called Nine, and like I said, very apolitical, all this stuff. So I I was not interested in that, and I was writing more political-minded material, socially, you know, conscious material, and my band hated it. <laughs> um, they just, it was embarrassing to them. They wanted nothing to do with it, really. Um, and so it was... At this same time, as this is going on, apparently Josh and Chad were sitting around on the front porch talking about how they wanted to get a band together that was political, that toured, that like got out of Newark, that talked about something because they were so sick of the Newark scene. And fortunately, the first person that came to their mind for singing was me. And so they gave me a call and I I think it was Chad called me. It was either Chad or Josh. I don't remember which one, but one of them called me and asked if I wanted to do it. And they almost didn't get it out of their mouth before I said, yes, please, let's do this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so we were definitely on the same page. But um, once that happened, then we had to go about finding a bass player and a drummer. Uh, we found Daryl, who was playing bass with uh, Chad and I before that in Jones Chapel. And Daryl then found Matt uh, because they went to high school together. So that was the first incarnation of Boy Sets Fire. You mentioned wanting to start a politically and socially conscious band. Mm -hmm. And that was such, I think to a degree, it was such a rarity back then because I mean, when I got into hardcore, a lot of it was like tough guy attitude stuff especially in Philly, there was kind of a division. You had your tough guy, purist, hardcore people. And then you had the other people who listened to the more metallic stuff like Shy Halud, Converge, all that kind of stuff. I guess it depends on where you're at, but there was not a lot of bands really speaking out about things. Yeah, it was weird here. It was such a weird combo of um, like either Lookout Records, like pop punk type of stuff, Berkeley style stuff, or... It was like not touch and go, uh, amphetamine reptile, like Jesus lizard. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like, and those scenes, I mean, there was political stuff in there, but it just wasn't, you know, and then there was like a couple of bands that were more, I don't know, like emo, I guess, but not really like nobody just, nobody talked about anything. Like it was just feelings or drinking or whatever. Right. So we wanted to do something different. And we got together and started playing music. And the first thing that we wanted to do different was, you know, be a political band and actually work to get out of the town and go on tour. Uh, The second thing was something that came totally by accident in that they were playing music and I didn't know whether to scream or sing to it. Yeah. And so I went, why not do both? (laughs) <laughs> and, and it just that was really as simple as it was. It was just like, okay, I guess I'm just going to scream when it feels right, sing when it feels right, and we'll go from there, you know. And then it was Josh and I who picked up a copy of Maximum Rock and Roll's book, Your Own Fucking Life, mm-hmm. and went through that thing and just started making phone calls. It's like we have a band, we would like to play. Let's do this, you know? (laughs) That's how it was back then. Tommy, you talked about that before with Audience of One. Like, you would just just call numbers that were on flyers and be like, can we play? Right, right. (laughs) Or or you would go to, uh, like, we would see people that knew people that booked, and they would be like, oh, yeah, 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 here's this dude's email address. I remember having so many, like, just slips of paper with someone's, like, (laughs) like, X's on both sides. X envelope x like <laughs> right. at aol.com and i was like yeah. fuck we got to email this dude yeah yeah right. just email him and, or no go on instant messenger see if he's got that same screen right. name and just <laughs> literally that was it and it was just kind of cobbling it together and yep. then being like all right uh we got some roadmaps and a fresh pack of smokes let's go yeah man <laughs> there's, there's huge like you'd have the atlas and then you'd have like a huge like bundle of like directions and some of them would be go to city center and look for punks. <laughs> <laughs> there were so like I think it's funny now is we we post a couple of things on Instagram with like old show flyers and we we read the directions and it's like you'll see a KFC turn here right. and it's like <laughs> which direction it doesn't right. say which direction left <laughs> or right what the fuck <laughs> 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 I remembered like 
driving to North Jersey to, to a show, just driving, trying to find a show. And I, I would just give up. Yeah. I'd be like, I'd be like, I can't find it. I'm going back <laughs> I home. I can't find a show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's crazy. And it like, they did, I, I definitely did that myself. Like just go to a city because like, like we were saying, like this area is so pushed together. Like you could go to Jersey, you could go to Philly, you could go to DC, you could go to Baltimore, you get, you know, New York even. Yeah. And just sort of look for shows, look for flyers. And that was the best. You could just go to a, a, a main street and look on posts for flyers. Yes. Like, yeah. Oh, there's a show. Awesome. I'm going to go to that. It's in someone's basement. And that's just a normal thing that you would do. Randomly show up at some stranger's home in their basement. Like <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I remember one time uh, there was a the venue in Philly called fun. o rama. Do you guys remember that one? Yep. It, it was not. it was somebody's basement, I uh, think in, in West Philly. Okay. And somebody told me they were like, yo, uh, it, uh our our mutual friend Doug was like, yo, creationist crucifixions on tour, they're playing Funorama. I was like, Where is it? And he's oh, nice. like, here's the directions. And we got there and I remember looking at the front door and being like, This is somebody's house, dude. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. there, there's nobody out front. We were like early. I was like, I don't I don't think this is the place. And then sure enough, like 10 minutes later, we saw somebody walking up and Doug went, that's the dude from Brutal Truth. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> we're in the fucking right place. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Basement shows were always a bummer to me back then because as a, as a young hardcore kid, I always wanted a really big show with a lot of people where everyone was just clobbering the shit out of each other. Uh-huh, right. And that, that usually could not happen in a small basement. Oh, you'd be surprised. You should have <laughs> seen, you should have seen some of the, uh, Jersey shows like for the love of, and, uh, <laughs> CR and bands like that. Like oh, it was yeah. terrifying. <laughs> down there, like, why, like number one, did you guys ever heard for the love of, oh, and of he course. would oh, hit yeah. that, an, an, that anvil, and, yeah. shit. and like people just lose their damn minds and you'd be in a basement and people grabbing pipes and asbestos is flying everywhere. <laughs> it's like, ah, uh, it's fucking nuts. My biggest reg- one of my biggest regrets in hardcore, I think it was the f- second show I ever went to. Uh, it was college of New Jersey. Everyone played Converge, oh, yeah, Dill- yeah, yeah, yeah. Dillinger, Turmoil for the love of everyone. Yep. I did. I sat outside for, for the love of, because I didn't know who any of the uh, bands were. Yeah. So I just d- did what my friends did or some of them. And it was apparently like the craziest show ever. Yeah, they were great. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's actually, there's video of that Creationist Crucifixion. If you go on YouTube and type Creationist Crucifixion Philly, it's in somebody's basement. It's like, it's that Funorama venue, right? Talking about like, oh, people weren't dancing. They got so mad because people were dancing. I yeah. guess one of the guys that was in their band got hit. <laughs> and comes up on the microphone and I, I think it's on the video he goes somebody just fucking punched me in the face and somebody in the back goes welcome to philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> that is the best philly thing i've ever heard in my life that i absolutely love that <laughs> we played we played with creationist crucifixion in ohio i think it was in cincinnati but it was a very different setting like it was it was all <laughs> us kind of bands and everybody was emo and holding book book bags and shit <laughs> no <laughs> nobody punched anyone <laughs> were your first few releases self-released uh yeah the first well we did a demo tape which we we pestered every label you can think of or name we pestered the shit out of them with that mm-hmm. demo um and then we self-released the consider seven inch Mm -hmm. Uh, which was then later re-released by initial records. So the self-release, we self-released two demo tapes and a seven inch. And I, I just really like hearing about bands taking things into their own hands Mm -hmm. as far as booking and recording music and putting it out because I don't know. I I wish I had more of a DIY attitude back then and just got things done. Yeah. I I always I always really like when you hear bands doing that shit because mm-hmm. it's like, all right, if you're not going to do it for me, we're just going to do it ourselves. Yeah. We want to do this thing. We're going to get it done. And it's it's funny how it's come around full circle too because now um, Oisey, who has been basically mine and Boy Sits Fires like life manager and a, basically another member of the band for like twenty years. Um, has runs the label and hits. 
So, which is a label that basically Boy Sets Fire started and he's running. Mm-hmm. So it's it's sort of cool. Now everything that Boy Sets Fire releases, everything I release as a solo artist is all through end hits. Now it gets distributed over here through like Death Wish and stuff like that, but it's all through our own label. So it's sort That's of great. cool to have that again, to just be like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. It's great. Like, Yeah, you could put out like an ambient album if you yeah. want, a, a country album. Yeah. Fuck it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I put those out on one album. <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Misery Index, Note from the Plague Years. How do you remember shows back then? When I got into shows and started going to them, I guess around 98, 99, In Philly, it was always really crazy. Like, if there was a band like Another Victim or like one of the tough guy bands playing, I would be really afraid because I knew some shit was going to go down. Yeah, that was those, those were the shows I stayed away from. I didn't go to Bad Luck 13 shows. I didn't go to, even (laughs) though I love those guys, like, those are friends of mine, but, um, but I still wouldn't go to those shows. And, um, uh, usually, usually I went to shows at, uh, Stalag 13. Yes. Same. Yeah, so those were always my favorite. I, I remember I was saw Refuse there; it was awesome. Um, and and then we played several shows there. I'm trying to think of anywhere else. I know that I went to other shows that were in like weird squats in the middle of Philly somewhere. Uh, yeah, can't recall what what the hell was going on, but that's <laughs> that seems to be a, a running thing for me. It's like so I was at this place. No clue when or what was happening, but I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Some things I don't remember at all, and then there's a lot of things I, I remember every detail. It, yeah. just, it just depends. Yeah. So when do things start picking up for Boy Sets Fire? When we did, when we went with the initial records and we started, we put The Day the Sun went out, mm-hmm. um, there was a definite notable bump to where we were getting invited to festivals. We were getting invited to play more shows. And it wasn't us hunting down shows. It was more being asked to play shows, which was a big thing for us. And I remember like the first time we made $100 at the merch table, we about lost our shit. Like It was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? How did that even happen? We're rich. Like <laughs> Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for everyone. Uh, but... um. But then the the big bump uh, happened with after the eulogy. So right. we we signed a victory, and um, we I'm always rather proud of this moment, and I'll say why because everyone has a victory horror story. Right, we don't, and the reason why we don't is because we signed a motherfucking one off with victory <laughs> uh. one album. And that's all you motherfucking get. <laughs> like, How did you manage that? Uh, he, Tony didn't think it through. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think that he thought, and it was pretty noticeable afterwards that he thought that if he had us, if we got our one off that he could leverage it against like videos and different things where it's like, well, I'll give you a video. If you give me another album, if you do, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. And it yeah. didn't work. Cause he'd say that. And we're like, okay, we don't need a video that bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember actually we, we did like a, a fan source video thing for rookie where people just made their own videos of, of it. Oh, yeah. And, and just, you know what I mean? So it, we won on that one and it was pretty funny because when we decided to move on in other directions, I remember Tony being so pissed off and angry and I'd never even met the guy. Like yeah. I didn't meet him until after we were well off that label, like yeah. at some show in Chicago. So like, whatever. But it was, um, it was just funny because everybody has a horror story and I was, it's, I've made a lot of dumb mistakes in my life and even, and especially after that, but but in that moment is a time that Boys Is Fire can look back and go, that was right. <laughs> you know, what I mean? we did it. <laughs> like, uh, and and what was really cool about that is that so we had in Europe we had this guy Kiro who was the PR guy basically, and I don't mm-hmm. know if he was working through Victory or it was like Victory through Sony or I, I don't know how it was played out. But this guy was a workhorse, and he's still a friend of mine to this day. Uh, he doesn't—I don't think he does PR anymore. I think he's a booking agent. But like, 
Um, I still see him out at shows to this day, but he single-handedly blew Boy Sets Fire up in Europe. It was it was absolutely him. He worked me like a dog. He's, it was it was interviews from like eight in the morning until eight at night. Wow, every day, and um and it was it was intense, but it was great. It paid off. And here in the states, we were playing um, Warp Tour. We were getting all these new things past like the festivals, like because the like more of the music festivals and stuff like that and a crazy fest and stuff that we were getting with initial. Now we were getting into a different territory with victory where we we're playing these national festivals, you know, and, um, and that was huge. And so the U S and Europe were sort of building at the same time. And we, we got to the point where there was like, wherever we played, there was like a thousand people and it was wow. awesome, you wow. know? Um, and then we made some bad choices. <laughs> Let's talk about some of those. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and it's funny because all these like bad choices, I don't, I, I mean, I look back and I go, ah, oh, we should have done that differently. But at the same time, what a cool experience, you know? Um, yes. So we, it came to a decision between going with Epitaph or Wind Up. And Wind Up was offering more money, to be honest. Mm. Um, and, and at that time we were thinking about how we create and maintain a career out of what we're doing right now, looking back, the better choice would have been taking less money up front with Epitaph and having the perks that come along with that label, you know, um, it, it was a stupid mistake. We should have absolutely just signed on the dotted line there and moved on. But uh, we also had a lot of inner turmoil with the band where uh, Matt, who was playing drums with us, was the boss of the band uh, for the most part. And how does the drummer become the boss of the band? Oh, God. That's fuck, rare. Fuck me. I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> it without Without getting... Okay. Because I think it's fair to tell my story on this, but I don't want to get to the point to where I'm necessarily shit talking to where it looks bad. Because sometimes if you, even if you're speaking the truth, people are like, ah, I don't want to hear you talking shit on other people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yes. and, and so I, I don't want to do that, but I do, it, it was not destined to last Matt being in the band or being the overseer of the band. And honestly, I feel I would be doing myself a disservice not to say that he was a bully. Mm. And and he had a lot of control over things that he shouldn't have. Right. And and that was the rest of our fault, I think, looking back at it. And I think we all agree on that, is that we all let him get to a point where he got a little power mad in that. And... And it, it it led to down the road us having to kick him out. But um, at the time, I, I don't know what it was, but you get into these relationships where it's a mental, a mentally and emotionally abusive, and you just sort of take it like we were talking about before. Uh, oh, you yeah. don't see any other options. You don't see any other way to it. And what's going on in your little cosmos is everything, you know. That yeah, and it's it starts slow and gradual, and it builds over time. Yes. I've been I've been in much mm -hmm. less serious situations, mm -hmm. you know, with work where it's like, oh, I guess this is how it is. Right. But then when you're out of the situation, you're like, holy what fuck, the what, fuck, what, yeah, what was I putting up with? Yeah, and 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 you nailed it right there with the slow build because if it happened immediately, you'd never tolerate it. Yes. But it's that slow build and there's this gaslighting that goes on with it. And and also thinking about it from me, who still had not uh, come out with what had happened to me and harboring wow. a lot of that inside and that abuse. Um, sometimes abuse feels it feels like home. Yes. You know, and um, and it feels familiar. So you latch on to it and you allow it. Right. And and I, I experienced this in that and in other relationships that I had been in. in. So uh, where I just, I took a lot of bullshit that I shouldn't have. But 
with that said, uh, he pushed us in that direction. And, and we went that way and it was a terrible mistake because we didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. Um, now, now I have to say, um, and I'll, I'll explain why I don't hold wind up accountable for any of it. Uh, we made the decision and a lot of times it's very easy for bands to go, Oh, this major label, they did this to me. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. (laughs) You read the contract, you know, you know, or you didn't read the contract and that was dumb as well. But, um, I can't say a lot of bad things about them because even though they did not have the same vision we did and they really wanted to push us in some really corny directions, Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, after doing, after them spending a, over a million dollars on us to put out Tomorrow Come Today mm-hmm. and that not hitting like it was supposed to. Once we started going into writing for uh, the Misery Index notes from the Plague Years, they weren't hearing the hit. They weren't hearing a single. They weren't hearing a, you know, and it, it caused a lot of tension between us and the label because they wanted us to get writers. They wanted us to do all this corny rock star shit that we were not comfortable with. They mm-hmm. wanted us to make a uh, rewrite rookie and put the choruses in and make it a hook and like all this stuff. And it was like, we're, we're not going to do that. But despite the fact that they pushed for those things, I don't fault them because that was their job. That's what they were. They want, they felt they needed to do. And at the end of the day, when I called Alan Meltzer, who used to used to own Wind Up, who's since passed, he said, OK, let's part ways then and completely let us out of the contract. Mm. Wow. And like you hear all those horror stories, right? Yeah. And, and it did not happen with Wind Up. He, they were very cool about it. And they realized that it's like, look. <laughs> They can't work with us. We can't, it's two different worlds trying to work together and it's never going to happen. Right. Um, so at the end of the day, they, they realized that and they were very kind in, in just letting us go. Th- that's good. And, you know, I think about this a lot. And with, with hardcore bands and post-hardcore bands and all the weirder, heavier alternative stuff, I just don't think it's meant for a mainstream audience. And here's my thoughts. You guys let me know what you think. I think to to be mainstream and to really succeed on a on a major label and be in that world, I think you have to play the game. Like yeah. I think you have to mm-hmm. work with songwriters and cuz yes. like the same 10 guys write all the hit yeah. songs. And Josh like, Freese plays drums on all of them. Yeah, you yeah. have to plug yeah. into that world if you yeah. want to be a part of that world. Yeah. And that is absolutely true. It's it, it's um People don't understand that when when they hear bands and they're like, well, I could do that. No, you fucking can't right. unless you're willing to give up a lot of this artistic, you know, uh, it's 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 funny. Um, people don't realize at all yeah. uh, when when they get into that world, what it's like. It is very structured. It is very like it, it does not allow for a lot of creativity. It's a, it's like an office job, but for music, right. like yeah. you play the yeah. game, mm-hmm. you, you make yourself sound like Maroon 5 yeah. and, and you, you do what they tell <laughs> you, it, like that's it, how it works. And if you want that, God bless, run with it. You yes. know what I mean? No, no worries. I, I don't fault anybody for wanting that, but know what you want. Right. You know, don't, don't get into that thinking that you're going to just do some free form jazz album and like, it's going to, you know, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Like, you know, you're not going to do, uh, You know, even if you look back at Dookie by Green Day, yes, there was a reason that hit. You know what I mean? It wasn't, they weren't just doing whatever the fuck they wanted. You know, it it wasn't slappy hours or anything. It wasn't, you know, um, if you go between Dookie and then go back to um, any of their other albums or Seven Inches or anything before that, there is a definitive difference in the structure of those songs. And how yes. it works now. Now they were almost there because they were already poppy and catchy, and that's why the label took them on. But after that moment, they definitely had to change in many ways in order to get that success. 
and they nailed it. They did great. You know what I mean? And they still continue to change and do their thing, but, um, but they're not doing it. You know, I think one of the only bands that got into that played the game correctly and then got out was Radiohead. Oh yeah. yeah. They did it perfect. Like they came in, they wrote creep, they did the thing that they were supposed to do. And then they, once they got that big audience, they started to slowly change and do what they wanted to do. And it totally paid off and worked, but not every band can do that. Radiohead is one of the ultra rare bands where they can do whatever they want. The fans absolutely love it. And they continue to change and grow. And honestly, I haven't heard any, any of their records past hail to the thief, Uh but I respect the fact that shit, they, they called the shots. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because they, they somehow, and, and it is such a rare band that can do this. It was, it's like, it's like the grateful dead effect where, where your fans control the label to an extent, you know what I mean? Like the labels going, we really didn't do much for this band. We have to hold on to them because they're actually helping us. (laughs) Like, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy how that works. Like, and there's very few bands like the Grateful Dead or Radiohead, or I can't even think of many others, you know, where they just create this huge cult following that is just so dedicated to them. I, the only, you know, I was going to say, I think about uh, whenever I hear cult following, I always think of uh, Circus Survive. Their fans are like, there's literally like, uh, I've gotten like, because uh, the band I was in when I started playing music was with Anthony from Circa. Mm-hmm. And because of that, and because he's posted a couple pictures of me on his Instagram, I have a bunch of people that have requested to follow me and they're like Circa Survive fan pages. There's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of photos that you can just scroll through. People with Circus Survive tattoos. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they are they they think of it as they think of it as their fam. Like this is a yeah. family thing. This is mm-hmm. something that it's it's something we're a part of. Yeah, and it's it's really cool because mm-hmm. now they kind of have that freedom to be like, "Fuck you, we're gonna do whatever we want." Yeah, yeah, and that's great. I absolutely love that. Not only that, but if you think of it on a a human empowerment level where you have people who lock into this family that are fans of this band. And, and I've seen it before. I've seen it even on a smaller note with like my fans and stuff like that, but like with Circus Survive and, and, uh, Oh, what is that one kid's name? It's British kid that, uh, Oh goodness. Young blood. So I don't know him. You know, look him up. Awesome. Awesome. So his fans, though, same thing, uh, they're, they're like a family and you can see that it's like almost like, uh, people who feel left out, people who don't have that kind of family, who don't have that support, find support in this music and in the lyrics. And then they make connections with each other through that. And they find friends and they find new, like family, basically. Yeah. And how awesome is that? You know yes. what I mean? Like that you like, summed it up perfectly because that's hardcore and the scene has given me my whole life basically. All my yeah. best friends, uh, this podcast now, <laughs> wanting to get involved with music, playing in all different kinds of bands. I mean, it's it's given me a lot. Yeah. It's just it's just jogged my memory of something f- funny my mom used to say. My mom used to call because uh, she would see all my friends coming over, and I was like, you know, I, I was pretty tame in comparison to the way my friends. You know, a lot of my friends got tattoos, and you know, mm-hmm. they really dressed the part. <laughs> Yeah, my mom used to call my friends the island of misfit toys. <laughs> <laughs> That's She's awesome. Like, you know, you you and your friends, those island of misfit toys kids, that just like <laughs> you guys always seem to be somewhat dysfunctional. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> like, oh, oh, we are fairly yeah. accurate. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, proudly dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when does Boy Sets Fire decide to go on hiatus? How does it all come to an end? So it. Let's see. It's funny enough. It came to an end and a beginning almost at the same time, which was sort of awesome. Like it. Um, so I think we had gotten. Uh, so uh, it was we finally decided on doing notes from the plague years with equal vision. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they put it out and um, 
it was it was actually in the U.S. through Equal Vision and in Europe through Burning Heart Records. So we put that out and we started touring again. And the problem was is that we had wasted so many years of not doing anything, just writing, that we lost our fan base in mm. the U.S. And that's why we because. Fans in like Europe and Germany especially seem to be a lot more loyal to musicians and they sort of understand when musicians aren't constantly in their face all the time. The U.S., they don't get that. You have to be constantly there yeah. or they'll lose interest because the market's flooded to, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they'll just find something else. So we went back out on the road and we're playing to like 20 people you know, yeah. with that album. So it was very demoralizing. And not only that, but we had so much inner tension with Matt and, and just with all of us, like just at each other's throats constantly that we were like, look, this isn't worth it. We're not having fun anymore. This right. isn't something we want to do. So let's stop. Yeah. And, and in our, in our short sightedness and arrogance, I think, uh, was when we said, okay, that's it, a clean cut, we're done. What we should have done is just said, take a high, it's sort of like what we do now where it's like, we're not really together, but we are, and we'll play shows when we can and blah, blah, blah. You know, yes. <laughs> you know, we should have done that then, but we didn't. And uh, I think, but I, at the same time, I don't think it could have happened any other way at that time. We had to get away from each other. So we we broke up and we did the two last shows in Philly. And, um, and then I, I of course wasn't done with music. So I started the casting out Mm -hmm. and, um, and started doing, doing that for a while, uh, while we took a five year hiatus basically. And it was, it was a little bit. So I guess five years in, into the casting out, Matt started pushing for us to get back together Mm -hmm. and out of anybody that could have, that was terrible. Cause I was like, fuck no, uh, uh-uh. no, 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 <laughs> no. I've been on my own for five years. I, this dude sucks. Fuck this. Oh, like, he's the drummer guy. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So I was like, no, that's absolutely fucking not. I don't want to do this. I'm having fun <laughs> in a band where I don't get treated like shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it was then that I, and I don't know if it was planned or what happened, but I ended up Matt and I, I went to New York where he was and I was, we hung out and we ate food and we talked about our differences and we, we, we tried to work them out, you know, Mm -hmm. like, and, and it, it, it worked for the most part. And it was, I mean, worked enough for me to go, all right, let's, let's give it another try, you know? And so everybody was like, fuck yeah, let's try it. Let's see what happens. But this time let's set some guidelines. We're just going to have fun. We're just going to do this. It's not going to be a big deal. It's just, we're not going to fight for this. We're just going to be a band. And have yes. fun with it. And um, it was maybe a few months in, we realized the same old bullshit was starting over again. Oh, no. And and so we we had to kick Matt out. I'm sure he will tell that story differently, and it doesn't really matter. But, <laughs> um, but it, it's funny, because I don't really hold animosity for the guy. I don't, I don't care, you know? Yes. It's, I'm just, I just... I have to tell the story or I feel like I'm lying. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to tell, tell the story in a way that's dishonest. So, so we all decided, you know, it's, and, and it came to a head because Matt, I remember got in touch with Josh and Chad because he and I were button heads hard because mm-hmm. I had had the taste of freedom for five years and I was not <laughs> dealing with this shit. Right. And, um, and so I remember there was a little like, you know, Josh and Chad didn't really know what side to be on, you know, up until Matt said, well, it's either him or me. And they got in touch with me immediately and went, well, it's definitely not going to be him. So let's get rid of him. <laughs> like, It's weird. It's like, I mean, if you're if you're being asked to leave the band twice, there's there's got to be something wrong. And if it's if it's coming down to arguing, it's like saying him or me, I, I'd be like, no, like, no, we're not. No, yeah, we're yeah. not doing this. That we're gonna... definitely sealed the deal, I think, for Josh and Chad. When if yeah. if anybody goes him or me, well, okay, you made us made a choice then, you know, yeah. and, and a pretty easy one at that. So, yeah. so he we kicked him out, and um, 
it was soon after that that we started getting together um, While a Nation Sleeps. And funny enough, that album was a total, it came out for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it was a complete reclamation, a reclaiming of who we were when we started. Uh, While a Nation Sleeps was a motto that we had before we played Note One. Mm. Uh, We used to put out stickers Boy Sets Fire, While a Nation Sleeps. And they were these weird stickers that look like conspiracy theory stickers and stuff. Sort of like the weird symbol that's on While a Nation Sleeps. It was like a very mysterious thing. And nobody knew what the fuck it was. So people were just seeing stickers with Boy Sets Fire, While a Nation Sleeps. Or While a Nation Sleeps, Boy Sets Fire. And and people were like, what is this? So then once we came out as a band, they were like, oh, this was a band. Okay. <laughs> and so... So we decided to do that and then to also take songs that were pushed out by Matt. Uh, Um, So, and that happened a lot to where it was like, everybody liked a song but him, so it didn't get played. Okay. And so uh, all those songs are basically those songs. And so the whole thing in general was a, was a rebirth. So, and and a new beginning for us to where, we got uh, Jared, who used to play drums for Hope Conspiracy, and we had toured together, and we got in touch with him. He's like, hell yeah, I'd love to play with you guys. And he's been great. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite drummers in the world. Um, so, and, and the s- sweetest human in the world, too. Love him. Does Jared ever, like ask for something and then you get triggered because he's the drummer. <laughs> it's funny because that's, that is sort of how it started. Cause we were all like this. It was like first day we're all staring at him. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, just like, but, but the great thing about Jared is that he is such a sweet person and he's so talented and, and, and he's very humble and he's, I mean, he knows he's talented, but he's humble and he's, he's such a kind person that it very quickly let us put our guard down on it. You know what I mean? Where we were like, don't try it, drummer boy. You know what I mean? And then after a while, I was like, all right, I love having Jared around. And we we have really cherished him in this band since. It's been wonderful to have him. That's great. And I think coming from a previously tense situation, Mm -hmm. everyone was probably committed to just making it work as drama-free as possible. Yeah. And we had had so many dramas. Like, I mean, so... Robert, who plays bass with us now, used to play in a different band. He's German and he played in a different band that toured with us on like our first tour in Europe. Mm-hmm. And and he was just always the guy that we always wanted to bring on tour with us. He would guitar tech for us and stuff. And we went through a few bass players, but uh, Rob Avery, who was playing before him, quit on a tour. And it was funny because when Rob quit, I remember all of us going, Yes, we get to have Robert now. And so <laughs> so it's sort of cool the the journey that and and the same thing for Chris Rakis. So it's such a confusing story because we have two bass players who like Robert plays in Europe, Chris plays in the US, and 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 it's it's one of those things that can work because we're not a real band necessarily. You know what I mean? We can, we just do what we want whenever we want. And so we can have as many bass players as we want. Fuck you guys. You know? <laughs> so it's it's great having a group of people where everyone is just sweet and loving and caring and we're all brothers and it's wonderful, you know? Uh, and there's no bullshit anymore. It's just fun and we play when we can, we don't when we can't. And, and that's what led then. It, it's funny because if I think of how the casting out got started and how my solo stuff got started, it's sort of the same but very different in that the casting out got started out of anger almost, you know, out of what I was in. Whereas my solo stuff began when Boy Sets Fire were in a mode of hiatus, but in a good way. You know what I mean? Where we were just like, eh, we'll play at some point. Love you guys. Love you too. All right. You know? And, and I was like, you know what? Since we're not playing a lot, I'm going to start doing my solo stuff. Cause I've always wanted to do that. That was actually what the casting out was supposed to be. And, and I, I chickened out and got, you know, and decided to turn it into a band. But, um, so going from 
uh, While a Nation Sleeps. And then for a little bit, I did the Nathan Gray Collective with my friend Dan. And then uh, into the last Boy Sith Fire album, the self-titled album, uh, and Feral Hymns, my first solo album, there was so much redemption in that area. Yeah. And, and that taking back of everything to where that's what led to Feral Hymns and me talking, you know, Echoes being the first song that I wrote for that album, which the story goes back to the abuse that I'd faced in the church. Now, crazy enough, I was in this per- in this period where I was very fragile, you know, and, and in a good way, I think, because I had gone through, the casting out years were a mess. I was drunk constantly. I was pretty mean and just, I, I just wasn't great. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, and it, and it, it, it stemmed from a lot of that, pushing all that stuff down and keeping it all inside and just being, just being angry and all the time, just sad and angry all the time. So getting into the, the first solo album, it was more about it being time to let go. And I didn't necessarily want to, but I remember I was like, okay, I'm going to write a solo album. And I start writing this song and I'm like, oh no, (laughs) oh fuck. I don't want to write about this, but it's coming out. It's just, here it comes, you know? And I wrote it and I remember sending it to Oise and and a couple of other friends and going, you know, am I ready? Should I do this? Is this something I should do? Because I don't feel like I should do this. Maybe I should just hold it a a little longer, you know? And, uh, and the response I got back was like, no, it's, it's obviously time. This is a great song. These are great lyrics that put forth exactly what needs to be said. And, and then I started thinking it, uh, it, it was funny because that didn't necessarily change my mind. Like the thought of it being better for me didn't necessarily change my mind, but it was when I started thinking about how many shows I've played in my life. I've played thousands of shows Mm -hmm. in 25 years and holding this inside. And how many times was there someone in that audience that needed to hear it? Yeah. Yeah. And just thinking of all those years and all those shows and statistically it's impossible that there wasn't you know right um people that needed to see someone that they look up to someone who they see as who they are inspired by their music needed to hear me say something and say that it's okay that really does go a long way because before before i knew where to look for help I looked to people telling my story, whether it be musicians, yeah. actors, comedians, whoever it was, mm-hmm. who were telling my story. I would read biographies. I, I was just searching, yeah, searching for answers. And even in my unlimited experience with this podcast, talking about my addiction, and mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I don't go into a whole lot of detail about it for reasons, yeah. But I, I tell enough of the story because I want to be able to help other people because I didn't know where to look for help. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to listen to anybody. So I try to share my experience a little bit and a couple people have told me that it's helped them. So Mm -hmm. I really think it's a great thing to be able to get the courage to talk about that type of thing because it really does help people. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's real sometimes. And I mean, like, like for myself, I think I can't help anybody. No one gives a shit about what I have to Mm -hmm. say, but, but that's not the truth. Yeah. Like what we have to say can help people. And I think even on another note, something that I've been noticing a lot uh, as a man speaking on the issue of sexual abuse, um, it is very difficult for guys to talk about. Yes. Yeah. And and we internalize it hard. Yes. Um, and and we're socialized to internalize it. And to, and to question ourselves and our sexuality and our, you know, all these horrible things that it, it takes you down some very dark and awful roads. And, and what's been sort of cool 
is I've at least had three women that I can think of now who came to the show with their boyfriend or husband, went home, and their husband or boyfriend finally broke through and told them Mm. what had happened. And it all made sense to them at that moment. They were like, oh my God, thank you so much. I've been wondering what the fuck, I thought we were going to break up. You know what I mean? I thought I couldn't couldn't handle it anymore. Because, Because at the end of the day, this toxic masculinity that you see in this like, hurt men hurt people. And that's important to note is that the more we hold in these things and the more we allow ourselves to hurt and not get help, we are going to hurt other people. Right. And, and, and the more we can do to get help for those issues so that we don't in turn take it out on others, uh, the quicker, the better, you know, it's, it's very important. And, and there's so many relationships that could have been saved. There's so many, uh, situations that could have went differently if, uh, men were socialized different to feel, you know, to be allowed to feel, to be allowed to question things that happened to them, to be able to speak about these things without having to feel like they're weak because That's another thing, you know, where it's like, well, if you cry and if you get upset or if you, you know, it's, it's being upset is only okay as a man. If you're raging, Yes, you know what I mean? If it's violent, if it's angry, it's not allowed to be crying and scared. And so it's very important that we start changing that narrative and we start allowing boys and men to feel safe in their feelings and being able to cry and being able to be scared and to be, you know, quote unquote weak in a moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally with you. Yeah. It's powerful stuff. I think it's important. I mean, I still do that. There are times where I want to cry and I'm like, Nope. Mm -hmm. And I like cap it off and then I shoot and I shift my mind to something else because that's, that's how I'm, That's how I'm conditioned. Yeah, we say stupid shit like man up and stuff like that. It's ridiculous. And and we do it to each other a lot of times, you know, uh, because we're uncomfortable, even with like our closest friends. We're uncomfortable when our friends get emotional. We're uncomfortable when these things happen. So it's like, "Ah, shut up, man, whatever, you know, and we try and then and then we do that same thing to ourselves where it's like, "Ah, yeah, you know, I'm just, you know, just being a little bitch, whatever, you know, like it's it's awful. If, if yeah. we are to really stop and think about the words coming out of our mouths or those thoughts that we impose on ourselves and our other male friends, it's horrific. Mm-hmm. Like, why the hell do we have to act that way? And it, and it all comes from how we're conditioned, how we're socialized in this society. And that has to stop. We're hurting ourselves and we're hurting others. Yeah, and I think... I think an important part is knowing where, like knowing who to talk to, Mm -hmm. because, you know, I I used to get fucked up and I would just pour out my life story to. That's where the I love you, man thing happens. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, yeah, it would be a guy I haven't seen forever or someone I just met and I'd talk about how I'm addicted to drugs and my brother died and this and that. And then I'd be like, whoa, okay. You know, yeah. And sometimes yep. people would be into it and sometimes not. So mm-hmm. I'm like regular ass people aren't equipped to, to hear about that kind of stuff. Yes. Right. You know, like every day or mm-hmm. randomly or whatever. So yeah. I've said it before on the show and I'll say it again. You got to find your fucked up community. Yes. And lean yes. on them. Yes. You got to find, you got to choose your family, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I, I make it a point. Uh, so I, I teach in a middle school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I have a Mm -hmm. lot of kids that, especially the boys that think it's nothing is more paramount than proving how manly you are. Yes. And I think one of the things that my school has done a a phenomenal job of is, is including the, what we call SEL, social and emotional learning Mm -hmm. and teaching kids like the ability to be able to express emotions in a way that is healthy and productive, but also allows them to be like, yeah, this is what I'm feeling right now. And 
it's important that other people, if I'm feeling okay with it, it's important that I can share this with other people. And yeah. I always do a big thing in the beginning of the year where, you know, I talk to the kids and like, I say, you know, guys, there's no reason for you to listen to me. Mm-hmm. You don't know me from anybody. Right. So let me introduce myself. Mm-hmm. And I, I talk about growing up and I say, you know, like my father passed away when I was younger. Uh, I was five when my father died. Uh, and I go through all like, you know, not necessarily all the tragic parts of my life, but the things that have kind of shaped me into the person that I am. And I know I've gotten visibly upset when talking about those things. And I actually had a kid, uh, this was about two or three years ago, while I was doing it, stood up and came over and put my put his hand on my shoulder in front of the class. And the, kids, and the kids kind of snickered at it. They were like, yo, sit mm-hmm. down, sit down. And I was like, no, this is what people do. Right. When we show support for one another. This is it. And keep in mind, this is the first week of school. This right. kid doesn't right. know me from anybody. And he's yeah. like, yo, this is – like I, I forget how exactly he said it, but he basically said like, look, this guy's pouring his heart out out here, and mm. this is important that we hear this. And I was like I, – I felt so much – kind of pride in that moment of like, this is what we should be doing. Like this is, this is as as important as it, as it is that you guys can, you know, graph a linear function. This this is just as important. Like, because these are the things that these are the soft skills that I didn't learn in school. I, I, you know, 12 years of Catholic school. I I, I know my prayers in Latin, but I don't, (laughs) you know, I, I I don't know how to, I like, I still, if I get emotional, I still like look around like mm-hmm. is somebody watching. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I yeah. forget what movie my wife and I were watching. And I remember I got up and I turned out the lights because she was like, what's the matter? And I was like, Oh, I just can't see the TV really well. And this is like, we were, you know, I think yeah. we weren't even, de- you know, married at this point. I think we were just dating. And mm-hmm. I really, it was the movie we were watching was, um, Oh my goodness. Did you ever see that movie? The man on the moon about, yes. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it was the, the scene where he goes to, t- uh, I think it's, thailand and he has yeah. that with that psychic surgery where like oh yeah 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 he has that mm-hmm. moment where he realized they're pulling out chicken gizzards yes and he's like he just puts his head back and starts laughing and uh-huh. i had that moment of like i got choked up and i was like i don't i don't want this girl to see me like this and i was like no fuck that like this is important because if this is somebody i'm gonna spend my life with you better be okay with it yeah 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 like, and it was uh it was definitely one of those defining moments where I've had, uh, you know, getting emotional is not a big thing where I, I make a big show of it, but there's times where it comes up and you go, this feels right. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. I think like you, like Nathan, like you were saying, there's, there is definitely a point. Like I know when I was growing up because I, my, that my dad wasn't around, my mom would try to be, both mother and father at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like my mom would try to like, you know, she would discipline me and then be like, Oh, it's okay. (laughs) Right. 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 What? Right. You're the one that just, you're the one that hit me. (laughs) Right. 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 I just don't understand. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like we wouldn't be having this conversation had you not just done what you'd done. But I I think that's one of those things that it's, it's the uncomfortability that people don't like. And it's the, that kind of mindset is really difficult to embrace and, and kind of embody in a way that people feel is like, Oh, that's acceptable. And it's like, it, the more you take a step back from it and look at it and say, I don't give a fuck. I don't care if you think this is acceptable. This is what's happening. And you know, I talked to my daughters the other day, my, uh, this is Keith, go ahead and pre- press the napalm death thing. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> but my, no, my dog is really sick and, and we had the, the vet appointment and in my head, I'm going like, I'm going to talk to the, like my daughters are seven and the other one's 16 months. So I kind of sat them all down. I was just like the, you know, 16 month year old could care less, but the, my daughters, I was like, look, we're going to go to the vet. The dog is 12. She's really having a problem breathing. This may be not great news. So we have to be really, you know, mindful. Like when we're around the dog, be present, like make sure she feels comfortable, make sure she feels happy. And the girls were like, okay. And I started getting choked up and they're like, daddy, it's okay. And I was like, I I know that you think it's okay right now, but what I'm telling you is, is that we need to be prepared for this. And in my head, I keep thinking, 
watch this dog live for another two years. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then my stupid ass is being like, guys, be ready for the dog to die. Right. I might, I'm going to have to say it every day for the, <laughs> for, the, for the next 700 days in a row. <laughs> guys, be ready. <laughs> be ready. Here it comes. Dad, we don't uh, believe you anymore. <laughs> whatever you say, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> Boy Sets Fire did a tour over in Europe with All Else Failed. Yes, yes. One of our absolute favorite bands. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know you guys were tight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Known them for a very long time. Uh, we played a lot of shows together in the past, and we just recently took them to Europe with us, which um, was a treat because I love watching people who have never heard All Else Failed before. Yeah, because they're never ready for it. Like it's always like <laughs> like this. What is this, and why have I not had this in my life before? You know, <laughs> type of experience. So it's it's great. And not only that, but they are just the sweetest humans. I love them to death. Yes. and and it's it's it it, it was just an all around great time having them around. That tour must have been great. One because you're on tour with All Else Failed, and you get to see them every night. Yes, like Tommy and I. Whenever they play, we make a point to get our asses down to Philly and see it because it's mm-hmm. it's like a religious experience oh, yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. I I let it all out. I go nuts. It's mm-hmm. it's amazing. And yeah. two, those shows looked massive. Yeah, like those those crowds were crazy. I mean, what? How was that? Oh, it was great. It was great. We we do very well in, in Europe, especially Germany. So um, so it's. It's a very different situation than playing here in the States where like maybe a hundred people show up, maybe 50, who knows, you know? Yeah. Um, but over there it's, you know, a thousand and up. And um, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's hard, it's hard to ex- express or explain because I love all shows. Mm-hmm. So it's just sort of different. You know, uh, whether you have like a massive crowd of people or you have 20 people, all those people not only paid to see the show, but they're also investing their time, which is, is what I, I guess I came to the realization of many years ago. And I'm glad I did because it's the most important thing anyone in a band can ever realize. So yes, yes. People do pay money to see the show. That's not why you pay, play a good show. They will probably buy merch. That's not why you play a good show. You play a good show and you give 110% because those people out there could be doing something else. Yeah. And they chose with their time. We have a limited amount of time on the face of the earth. And these people chose to be there that night. Whether there's thousands of people, whether there's five people, whether there's one person, that person chose to be there to see you do this and how dare you waste their fucking time. Right. So that is what I always keep in mind. And I always use as 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 an encouragement to other people who are in bands. Fuck the money. Fuck everything else. It's their time. Your time is the most precious thing you, you own. And when someone wastes it, there's no bigger insult. That is a great way to put it. And I'm with you on that. I value time above all else. Mm -hmm. Give us the rundown for what is coming up and when we can expect it. Okay. So uh, coming up on uh, right now, actually, I am in the process of selling tickets online uh, on my Instagram and Facebook for a show I'm putting together that's going to be a run through of my, my album working title, uh, all acoustic. And so I'm going to do a show and I'm selling tickets now for that. So if anybody would like to see that, if you enjoyed the album working title and you want to see the acoustic version of it, please come buy stuff. So, um, (laughs) um, but after that, uh, the main, the main thing that I am doing right now is working on an album called rebel songs, which should be out in late summer of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, And it has been, it's a huge step from where I started with, with feral hymns and even then going into working title, which sort of took on more of a casting out sort of fast melodic punk sort of feel Uh, rebel songs. 
I have, so with, with my solo stuff, I've done a lot of very talking about feelings and talking about things of that nature because I was going through a lot and getting through a lot. And now that I've come to a place where, you know, we're never through it, but in a better place, I've, I've started to branch out back into, uh, social and political themes. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's funny because you're not ready to talk about certain things until you are. And it just so happened that it was like, okay, I've got all these thoughts again on, on things. Um, so not only that, but also I've been taking the melodic punk stuff that I love and that I do and that I've been doing since the casting out and thrown in a lot of new influences, uh, like reggae and hip hop. And now I say these things not to say that there's going to be a necessarily a hip hop song, a reggae song, you know what I mean? But it's all influenced in there yes. in, in what I'm doing. And I think it's, it's, it's a, it's been a very rewarding process, uh, using these new influences in what I do to create a new sound in this original sound that I'm, that I'm working with for rebel songs. So, if you get the chance, uh, come see me on Instagram, Facebook, you know what I mean, for updates on what I'm doing. Boy Sets Fire on that front, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, everything's so up in the air right now. We have one, we have a couple of things planned. There was um, uh, Furnace Fest down in Alabama and uh, Psycho Fest out in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And then there was there was a tour with hot water music that we're talking about in 2022 in Europe. But you know, these things are all sort of at the mercy of the pandemic at the moment, but that's, and, and that's all we really have planned right now is that when we can play, we are going to play, but you know, end of the day, I'll be focusing primarily on my solo work uh, and this new album coming out. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, the first album, This Crying, This Screaming, My Voice is Being Born, that got re-released on Dark Operative, yes? Yes, yes. Yes, it did. Is that out now? It is. It is out now. And um, Brent has was the first person to release that after uh, Conquer the World, and he has been the sole releaser of that album since. Um, <laughs> and, and just every once in a while, he'll throw out a new sort of packaging and vinyl for it. And it's always a really fun time. And it's always great. I love Brent a lot. So he's, he, he does great stuff. Yeah. How does it feel to be, that's a great label. How does it feel yeah. to be label mates now with greats like uh, Caspian and This Will Destroy You and Power Trip and everybody else? It's awesome. I mean, it's accidental on our part. You know what I mean? We <laughs> we wrote this album so long ago. So it's just that Brent, It it it's funny because it's cool to be uh, possibly associated with those bands, but even more so, it's great to be associated with Brent. Yeah. And I think that's why he gets class act bands is because he himself is a class act. He's a great guy. Like I just, I, I love that he still uh, cares deeply about that album and still pushes it. And yeah, Nathan, I just wanted to say thanks a lot for coming on the show. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've made so much great music over the years that me and, and many others enjoy. So I just want to say thanks for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's always a, an honor, and not just in the pandemic, it's always an honor that anybody would give a shit what you have to say, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Even, you know, whether it's times like these or any other time, the fact that anyone would want to hear what I have to say about anything is great. So thank you. Yeah, I feel the same way every time I post an episode of this podcast and uh, people listen to it, so. Right, <laughs> Awesome. Tommy? Yeah, I was going to say, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. I, getting back to your point of you chose to spend your time with us, mm -hmm. and we truly appreciate that because you could have done something else, and, and this is so awesome that you chose to spend it with us, and we, we truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. There you have it, folks, Nathan Gray. That was an amazing conversation, 
And you know what? I think it's great that he spoke about the things that he spoke about because that's got to be really difficult, man. I think that's uh, it, probably one of the most difficult things to talk about. Yeah. Because there's such a stigma attached to it. And then people, like he said, even like there's there's judgments that go along almost instantly as soon as that that topic is breached and i think people talking about it like he the way in the way he talked about it starts to remove that stigma and starts to kind of open people up to no this is okay this is not your fault and this is something that you need to be cognizant of like that people have gone through this and i I think the most poignant part for me was when he said you know I, i wish i had spoken on this years earlier specifically because i could have helped other people uh, yeah. And that that type of empathy you don't really hear from a lot of people. That was that was really awesome. I felt him getting very emotional and I was getting very emotional. You know, it's a very emotional week in general. So I was just like, "Oh, man." And I I I think that's fantastic that uh that he's speaking about it and that he can help people and you know, Boy, Boy Sets Fire is a classic band. Classic band. They were a big deal around here. They did it all. They did it all. International touring, you know, they, they did it all. It, it's one of those, um, I'm trying to keep thinking about like when I first heard, I, I remember listening to Anthony had a mixtape in his sob that was, had, um, the song, uh, the fine art of falling. Mm hmm. And I remember being like, wow, this song is amazing. Like, this is just a great band. And uh, I I didn't actually own the album until much later. That was one of those albums that kind of missed me. And I'm really glad we got to talk to them because they're definitely – the day the sun went out has this kind of – when I think of that era of music, I think of that album kind of like – because it's that Vitruvian man – and at that type of artwork seemed to be the go-to thing, but yeah. Boy Sets Fire was the first person, I, first group I saw do that. Yeah, is that kind of like older sketch overlaid with other types of like what do you call? It? I don't know what's the what's that type of like uh, collage kind of art. Like where Mm -hmm. it's like multiple things layered on top of each other. Just very, very cool. And at the same time, it's one of those bands that like when you see that cover, I I, I instantly think of driving around in Anthony's car when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. I missed them back in the day. I didn't see them. I didn't really hear them. I didn't discover them till later. After the eulogy, you ever hear that song? There's a sick breakdown at the end of that song. Yes, I know. That's that's one of the songs that I'm really familiar with. Um, And Rookie is a classic. I don't know, rookie. You will listen to it. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you'll know it once you hear it. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's one of those. As, as soon as I hear it, I'll be like, "Oh yeah, 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 that song." Yeah, it's really good. I also like the fact that they were on initial. I liked initial records. I know a lot of that stuff that what came out at that point in time kind of really got me. Like I remember seeing the old flyers for like Crazy Fest and being like, "Oh, I don't know that band." Like, or seeing a flyer for Crazy Fest and being like. Uh oh, that band is huge now. Anthony, this is a f- fucking crazy thing. I'm pretty sure it's the second or third Jazz June album came out on initial. I think it's the I forget what the name of that album is. Breakdance Suburbia. I think that's the one that came out on initial. But uh funny story was when we used to play that place when we were really young, it was called the Tri Hampton YMCA. And yeah. we booked bands there. And we didn't realize when we the other people had booked bands and Anthony's like, we're doing this. And I was like, okay. And he got jazz June to play. And what we didn't know is that they took a hundred percent of the door. <laughs> what? hundred percent. They took everything. So we had to pay jazz June out of our pocket. And I think we came up with like $30 between the two of us. They were so pissed. <laughs> they were so mad. They were like, they came from like that. They, I think one of the dudes from was like from Doylestown. The other guys were from like Emmaus. They were like traveled really far to get there. And I was like, Oh fuck these guys. We have no money for them. Like they were so pissed. I think Anthony has to, I have to get him on the phone one day and ask him about that because I remember be- leaving that show and getting into his car and being like, that was embarrassing. <laughs> we, sh- we need to plan this out better next time. That happened a lot back in the day. I mean, you have these 
random teenagers putting together shows. No one knows what they're doing. No. And it's like, you know, we would do stuff just to kind of be like, yeah, let's do this and not think through what your like the real consequences were. Like I, I remember driving to uh, one of a uh, show at Palanca and it was like the parking lot was completely full. People were parking across the street in the empty lot. And I was like, Oh no, <laughs> like, this is going to be a gigantic fucking problem. <laughs> like it was the, that, I, I think it was that spring fling that, that was done. It was like huge. And it was like, Oh, we're going to get in so much trouble because nobody realized how much attention this was going to draw. <laughs> I remember there's a video of all else failed playing there and there are people from the front of the stage to the back wall and yeah. it is crowded and it's like, fuck, there's probably, I don't know, 800 to a thousand people in there and one bathroom. Wasn't there men's and women's bathroom? Yeah, There was a men's and a women's bath, but there was only one bathroom per sex. Like, right. And in my head, I'm going like, this is going to be a nightmare. Like we're going to get in trouble because there's so many people here and this is 100%. And it's literally the Ben Salem police department is, I don't know, less than a quarter of a mile down the road. <laughs> like Every cop leaving their shift is going to drive past that and be like, what the fuck's going on there? So folks, I got to plug our one year anniversary extravaganza show is happening next week. Make sure you tune in. It's going to be up. March 8th. Make sure you listen to that shit. One year. Special guests, new and old, are going to be joining us, and we are going to be celebrating one year of the podcast. Isn't that exciting, Tommy? It's exciting and also kind of, it's still kind of mind-blowing to me that we've done this every week for a year. Yeah. It's still, like, I once in a while kind of like, just, you know, doing the naming conventions for sending you files, and you'll go episode 51 and i'm like really <laughs> yeah and you do that every week you're like what you like really is it we've done 51 of these it's so weird every week i'm like i can't do it anymore i can't do it anymore and then i'm like what are you talking about you don't do anything else <laughs> yeah this, this is it like this is the only hobby i this and skateboarding is the only hobby i have so I, it's either this or i i don't know what do men in their late 30s do get divorced yeah i don't want to do that yeah watch football like stuff like stuff that i don't want to do <laughs> like, yeah i'm not doing that let i'm me not pick, doing that i'm gonna pick up like a like a weird habit like i'm gonna start playing heroin darts <laughs> like some bar sport or some stupid shit that i don't want to be a part i'll start you know how about golf no heroin no i d- d- keith I, it's still one of those things that when i think about like those times when like it was really bad yeah. i still kind of am like that seems like a fever dream like that yeah. doesn't it doesn't seem real and it doesn't seem like i know that at times it was like really out of control but i've said this before on here but i i don't ever remember being with you being like i'm scared for keith that's you- weird i remember texting you i sent you a picture I wish I, I, I have this memory. I remember sending you a picture of a CD case covered in the particular drugs that I did at that time. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I do this one and I do this one. And like, did you ever get messages from me like that and be like, oh, he's in big trouble? I, I did get messages from you like that. But I always, again, you always seem to kind of have this air of responsibility that kind of always floored me. And again, it was that maybe it was imagined, but you always had this air of responsibility. Like you, you, you kept it together enough that I never was like, I was never outright worried about you until you called me. Jeez, this might've been four years ago. And you were, and it was, no, it was when you were, went into detox and you're like, I'm going into detox. You're not going to hear from me for a while. And I was like, really? I called you? You either called me or sent me like a long text. I probably texted you. And I was like, okay. Like, I I guess I never got that. And I think part of it was at that time, everybody was going kind of (laughs) hard. And it just 
kind of blended into the chaos that was already kind of around us and kind of surrounding that time. And I, I know there's a couple people now I'm worried about. I, I always think like, actually kind of going back to what Nathan said, like people aren't going to get better until they want to get better. As much as right. I can beg and plead and say, hey, can you do this? Go to a meeting, do this. You know, it, until they actually specifically st- want to do it themselves and make that conscientious choice to I, I'm going to stop or a, at least I'm going to attempt to stop. It's just not going to happen. And it, it's it, that, that really, that's what keeps me up at night sometimes where I'm like, Jesus, I, I, if I could do like, I'm making sure I do everything I can so that if God forbid the worst thing happens, I can say to myself, well, I tried. Guess what I bought to celebrate my promotion. An Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's a scratch on the face of it. No. <laughs> I bought Mike Tyson's Punch Out, the original NES cartridge. Oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. That's a really good one. I actually did so did is it one of the ones um are you gonna like display are you gonna play it or display it? No, it's it's just the the cartridge. It's not like a mint boxed version or anything like that. Okay. I'm going to play it. Okay, cool. Yeah. I actually was thinking about this the other day because I I was playing one of the emulator games and it was just glitching out on me really bad on that the that ras- I have that Raspberry Pi the Retro Pi one and yeah. I was playing um do you remember Bubble Bobble? Yeah. I was playing that with the girls and you know each level that you complete you sink down to the next level. Yeah. And when we sank to like level 12 or something like that, everything went like all pixelated. And the girls were like, what happened? I'm like, the game broke. <laughs> like, I yeah, don't... you, you, I will send you what I use. The, okay. the PC emulators are where it's at. And then you can hook your PC up to the TV with an HDMI cable. You see, that's, it's like, it's, some of them are flawless. Like Metroid is flawless uh legend of zelda is perfect like i have not encountered a single thing wrong with them but then there's these games that like you remember golden axe for a sec like that one golden axe one and two it it just it glitches out the whole time and it's it's really disappointing that's annoying it is especially when you're like making progress (laughs) like well we're out of time folks tommy and i are beat we got a lot of shit going on yeah you know, but well, listen, thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Nathan for speaking to us tonight. That was awesome. Make sure you tune in next week for the one year anniversary and like subscribe, rate us on Apple podcasts. We want that. We need that. Uh, and you know what? Don't give us any one star reviews because we can't handle it right now. Just only give us five <laughs> star reviews and write why you think we're great. And, uh, That's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and until next time.